the development of iron production was a revolutionary achievement in history. The wrought iron and its procurement were first established in 3rd millennium BC, in the territory of Anatolia in the wake of the Hittite Empire. Even before its demise in the Late Bronze Age, individual pieces traveled as gifts and merchandise across the Mediterranean. After the Late Bronze Age collapse, the knowledge of iron metallurgy was adopted by the Hittite successor states, Phrygia and Lydia, and from there it spread across the Mediterranean and Europe. At the passage from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age, around 10th century BC, first iron objects already made their way into Central Europe through trade routes with the Mediterranean civilizations. These were mostly examples of jewelry and individual pieces of weapon. Iron didn't completely replace bronze. People exploited both resources and necessary ore deposits. At first, jewelry was made from the combination of iron and bronze, but later, iron jewelry disappeared. Besides the visual appeal, the shining bronze was easier to melt and shape into detailed ornaments. As such, people continued to use bronze for more prestigious items and ornaments. Even pieces of armor would also be made of bronze, being in equal manner a prestigious symbol of power and an instrument of protection. Sites rich in iron ore enabled development of metallurgy and prosperity of European cultures beyond the more famous Mediterranean civilizations of Greece, Phoenicians and Etruscans. In the 8th century, objects made from iron were already dominating the Haustat societies and accepted as the best material for weapon production. While iron was more durable and harder than previous materials, it also required more knowledge and time to process. Ironworking also required large amounts of good quality wood and charcoal, leading to large-scale forest clearings and changes in the landscape. Oftentimes iron ore in Europe could be found on or very close to the surface as limonite deposits. These appeared in many places as large lumps, weighing anywhere from a few grams to several kilograms. In areas rich with lakes, bogs and swamps, this often came in the form referred to as bog iron. Additionally, pisolytic iron, bean-shaped grains with high iron-bearing hematite or porous limonite, was often collected on the ground or at the floors of sinkholes and caves. Such surface deposits are mostly depleted and economically irrelevant today, but during the first millennium BC, it was the driving force of Haustat societies and the backbone of their economy. It was this easy access to the iron ore that made the mines mostly unnecessary, and the close vicinity of settlements to rich iron deposits provided another potential advantage over rival settlements. Archaeologists found traces of smelting in most large settlement centers. People smelt iron in rectangular and cone-shaped furnaces, built from stone and clay, which could reach one meter in diameter. Iron smelters used the furnace only a few times before demolishing it, building a new one on the same or nearby location. This could lead to the remains of several hundred furnaces within a single settlement throughout the era. Archaeologists identified two types of furnaces, slag tapping type and a slag pit furnace. The iron smelters blasted air into them through bellows, leading to higher temperatures needed to melt the ore. The furnace had to be sturdy enough to endure temperatures beyond 1,400 degrees, while some ore allowed the separation of slag from the bloom, spongy mass of iron and impurities, already between 800 and 1,100 degrees. The different impurities mixed within the ore are one of the reasons why it had a low enough melting point to be reached by ancient Europeans. In the best case scenario, the iron worker would achieve temperatures beyond 1500 degrees and an atmosphere for a reduction process within the smelting furnace. This was followed by the cooling of the heated mass in a controlled environment. The smelting could last the entire day, but due to the relatively low temperatures, only a couple of kilograms of malleable iron bloom could be recovered, as most iron remained in the waste slag. The bloom would be of high enough quality to be hammered into semi-finished products. The entire process of producing iron was a complex procedure which was mastered by only a few individuals, who probably shared their knowledge and secrets only to their successors or a small circle. Haustat culture spread across a vast area of Central Europe and marks the early Iron Age in the region. It was named after the archaeological site in present-day Austria, where a large settlement thrived through trade of metallic products and rock salt. The right to rule in the Haustat societies wasn't passed on in the family, but was gained and maintained through the display of martial abilities, like dueling, hunt and battles. The rulers, Haustat princes, commanded the most respect and prestige, shown through their rich graves, stocked with battle equipment and other gifts. Warriors were split between the footmen and horse riders. 
Battle horses of Haustat warriors were often imported from the Scythian communities in the east, as their horses were larger than the local breeds. Riding equipment and even horses and carriages could also be buried with their rider. It was the horsemen who were the best equipped and probably held the highest power. The transition into the Iron Age wasn't sudden. For example, the votive offering of weapons by the bodies of water reflect the Bronze Age customs, while the materials and weapon designs evolved in the image of the Iron Age. Additionally, swords of the same design but different materials were found, from fully made of bronze, to fully made of iron, to a combination of the two. X-rays of swords of that time show us that they were often repaired, sometimes a pommel would be fastened to a completely new blade and vice versa. After the 7th century BC, iron axes and spears came to dominate the area. Throughout the era, spearheads and axes got longer, thanks to the sturdier iron that didn't bend as easy as bronze. Spearheads could reach even up to one meter in length. Battle equipment, from weapons to armor, had to be both an effective combat implement, as well as a symbol of power and prestige. Both axes and spears could be decorated with different ribs or inlaid with bronze or even gold. Decorated belts also showcased their status and achievements. Prominent warriors were buried with pieces of figural depictions, like Sicily. The equipment of warriors at the transition from 7th to 5th century BC was fairly identical, almost standardized. Archers too were a part of early Iron Age armies, and were able to achieve a very high status. Hunting with bow and arrow was reserved for higher ranking nobility. Some archers even adopted equipment of the raiding Scythians, using their trilobate arrows themselves. Like with axes, the evolution of early Iron Age warriors can be seen through helmets. The earliest were conical helmets, which were characteristic for warriors of Crete and Eastern Mediterranean, but their design came all the way up the Adriatic and into the heart of Europe. They were followed by the bowl-shaped helmets. These were most prominent in the area of southeastern Alps and continued to dominate some communities for next centuries. The bowl-shaped helmets were made out of interwoven twigs and leather, which was reinforced with round plates made of bronze and studs. In the early 5th century BC, double-crested helmets came to prominence, often decorated with plumage, probably made of horsehair, and extended with decorative ribbon to reach the middle of a warrior's back. The Nigao helmets conclude the progression of Haustat helmets. These were first heavily used by the Etruscans, though many were also found in the Alpine area, indicating trade contacts with the region. Helmets were a symbol of prestige and were put into the graves of prominent warriors. Their evolution and the development of weapons shows high degree of mastery the craftsmen of early Iron Age possessed. Haustat economy relied on prestigious goods beyond weapons for trade, display of local prosperity and personal glory achieved through dueling and martial exploits. The era of Haustat princes and warriors would last until the arrival of Celts and the La Ten culture in the last five centuries BC.